My name is John Hansman. I'm a professor of aeronautics and astronautics at MIT. I'm also the director of the MIT International Center for Air Transportation. Uh, I've been at MIT since I was a graduate student. I originally came here as a physicist, but I worked as a pilot through, um, through grad school in the summers and ended up sort of combining my interest in aviation with my interest in sort of underlying things that drive uh, air transportation. Let me tell you a little bit about what we do in teaching capstone classes. Um, I teach the aircraft design capstone class in the Department of Aeronautics and Astronautics. And about 10 or 12 years ago, we started a collaboration with uh, Lincoln Lab where instead of having artificial design projects, what we did is we'd have real, real vehicles that someone wanted designed and built. Lincoln and the Beaver Works helped collaborate an interaction between, initially it was the Air Force. So the first projects we did uh, were actually Air Force projects. Um, after a, a, a startup project, we ended up doing something that we called, um, we call Locus, it's now called Perdix. And it was an interesting design challenge. It, the, the students were asked to design a, a vehicle, a small UAV, that could be shot out of an anti-missile flare canister. Uh, and then fly for uh, an hour, or so, half an hour to an hour. <clears throat> and then they actually wanted a swarm of them so that they could do sampling of the atmosphere. This is a real tough challenge. So the, the design requirement was you had to fit into a two inch by two and a half by seven inch canister. And it would be shot out of this anti-missile flare canister at a 300 G launch load. The airplane would then unfold and fly its mission. And by the way, at the time, people thought this was way out of the box in terms of feasibility. Uh, the students actually came up with a really innovative design where the airplane was able to fly. Uh, they built the aerodynamic prototypes. They built uh, unfolding prototypes. They tested it uh, out of a launch chamber and actually dropped it of a balloon. And the students then presented it to a, a conference, an industry conference. And suddenly the industry got interested and realized that this really could be done. Now, interestingly, that project became classified for about three or four years. Students didn't know what was going on, got taken over by Lincoln and then the industry, and then has become, it was shown on 60 Minutes, it became the U.S. Swarm UAV. So that's an interesting example of the students actually innovating things there. The Air Force came back to us and they said, okay, that was really cool, but that was an electric powered UAV. It would only fly at about uh, 80 miles an hour when it was uh, cruising along. Could you do something like that, but actually fly at Mach 0.8? Uh, through the challenge back at the students, there were no there were no engines that would be appropriate for a small UAV that could fly there. Uh, we sort of thought about it, came up with, realized that you could use a solid rocket motor UAV, but um, it had to burn very slowly. Normally, you want a rocket to go really fast. In this case, we wanted it to uh, f basically have low thrust. So. A uh, set of students actually came up with a new formulation for solid rocket propulsion systems uh, where we can control the burn rate. Um, and then, then we started to put together the concept for the vehicle. So one of the interesting things we could do now is use new technologies like 3D printing. This is actually the fuselage of one of the uh, prototype vehicles. It's 3D printed in titanium, so the, the solid rocket uh, engine goes in here. Um, and it actually, this is, provides the thrust, you, the wings go on and, and it can be uh, launched out of another vehicle. Um, interestingly, nobody had ever built so, um, solid rockets that run for a long time at this size. So the small, the very high temperatures inside, your 2000 degrees uh, inside the rocket motor, needs to be insulated so you don't melt the case. Um, we sort of figure out ways to do that, but uh, the rocket uh, nozzle ended up being a big problem. So, because uh, you basically get a concentration, a, um, a thermal concentration, the uh, thermal gradients are so high that you would crack the nozzles. So now the students use sort of innovative ideas and ended up uh, 3D printing um, basically an insulator that was designed, it's hard to look at this, so the stress relief is designed into the ceramic uh, nozzle. So, you know, the, the examples here are interesting cases of the students sort of being given a problem that's harder than generally even the industry thinks it can be done. And don't tell the students that it's too hard. Just let them rip with the different technologies and ideas. So we've really been very successful at, at being able to connect these things together. 
Um, recently, we've done other vehicles, so we did a, a long endurance uh, UAV for a communication relay platform that we call Jungle Hawk Owl. In the last year, did a, a super short field takeoff and landing uh, prototype for uh, Boeing and Aurora, where we use electric propulsion to blow air over the wings. Um, that allows you to get really short takeoff and land. So the prototype design was for a four passenger airplane that can take off and land in 50 feet. Um, and this is actually competing with what's called electronic uh, uh, vertical takeoff and landing airplanes. We think um, because of the challenges um, in, in the control and vulnerabilities, if you were to lose a propulsion system on just a multi-rotor system, that it may make more sense to actually use a uh, more of a conventional design, but where you use that same technology to get real short field takeoff and land. Uh, so we're able to successfully do that. Uh, this year, the current project is to do a solar uh, stratospheric uh, environmental monitoring uh, vehicle in collaboration with Harvard, where we're looking at specific environmental impacts uh, that we're worried about as a result of global warming. So we're going to put a vehicle up there. It's designed to sit in the stratosphere for a month or two months and actually track specific deep convective storms in the central U.S.